Hi everyone, welcome back. This is OILS 513, Digital Information Management. And we are on Learning Module 7, Architecting Information Management Systems. Uh, this week we will look at the software industry, open source software, content management systems as a software server application, and you'll get some hands-on experience working with a CMS system, uh, which is uh, based on the Drupal open source application. Human beings have been developing and using information management systems for at least the last 5,000 years, probably longer than that. The average evidence shows, however, that for most of that period of time, the collection and organizing of information was by today's standards pretty rudimentary in nature. Early Mesopotamian scribes wrote official records on clay tablets. These tablets were then sorted by record type. Many specimens that remain are proclamations and financial records and stacked in the order that they were created or received. Retrieval of clay tablets must have been a somewhat laborious process that involved manually looking through hundreds of tablets to find a record needed. Once fiber-based writing surfaces like papyrus and paper were developed, written records were recorded in scrolls that could be rolled up, stacked, and bundled in loose leaves or bound in book form. Thus, the first truly functional information system became the bound or book catalog in which business transactions, inventory records, or the holdings of collections of objects or books were recorded. However, up until the mid-19th century, the bundling of individual sheets of parchment or paper, then tying a ribbon or string around the bundle to keep records together, continued to be a common practice for information organization. While this short summary glosses over a number of historical details, it wouldn't be untrue to say that relatively little progress was made in information management between the time of the great Mediterranean civilizations of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and the mid-19th century in Europe. It isn't until then that we begin to see a more systematic approach to information storage and retrieval most likely because advances in technology and trade required that technical and business records be kept for long-term future reference. The major advance in 19th century information management came in the form of the card index, which enabled records to be quickly and easily filed or retrieved. The use of card indexes proliferated in business, government, and of course in libraries, Card indexes actually enabled the development of modern information theory and information management. Because for the first time in human history, huge volumes of information could be filed together in one location at one time. Card indexes spurred the development of filing systems, authority control, which that is naming conventions, and field-based information records. So the humble card index was actually a necessary step in the ev evolution of record keeping from clay tablets to electronic information systems. Today, of course, our information management systems have moved from being physical entities to being completely electronic resources. However, a common thread still connects the modern information manager with the ancient Mesopotamian scribe. We still need to create repositories or venues in which human records can be gathered, organized, and stored. Thus, today's information manager cannot function without a server or database full of information. Just like the medieval scribe was nothing without his scriptorium. The first practical electronic information systems were developed after the Second World War in the late 1950s and 60s, where we saw a, an exponential increase in the capability of technology to create, uh, transmit, and store electronic information. 
Fortunately, today's information systems can be implemented with relative ease and at low cost, and there are many different types of systems that an information manager will either encounter or use regularly. This week, we'll discuss a wide variety of computer-based information systems that are available to us, and we'll work directly on a Drupal content management system. We are particularly fortunate enough to be working with information management at a time when there are many specialized types of systems available as both commercial and open source software. So first, let's talk about types of software production. And there are a lot of variants in how we would classify software licensing, packaging, and delivery systems. For our purposes in the short time that we have to talk about this, um, we're going to focus on generally acceptable commercial software production practices and newer open license kinds of software creation and distribution practices, also known as open source. Oops, sorry. So as I mentioned, commercial software was initially produced in the 1950s after World War II, and it quickly was adopted by industry and government uh, as a manner uh, that uh, huge amounts of data could be stored, processed, and retrieved. In the 1950s, software was designed specifically uh, for a particular hardware configuration. So you actually you bought the computer hardware, and then the software was something that, that was designed to operate specifically with that particular piece of hardware. And this remained the case up through the 1970s, uh, when software remained hardware specific, even up through the uh, creation of the first uh, desktop type computers. However, the personal computer revolution saw the advent of hardware that was independent of software or vice versa. Software became portable. You could buy a certain class of hardware and there was a lot of variation between the different components that you could buy in the hardware but you could still run the same software on it and software business models developed out of this portable uh, software model um, to include specific types of software licenses that were sold to customers. And these include per unit or per copy of software purchase, uh, per user or seat based software licensing, and per connection uh, or concurrency type of licensing. So the three different types of purchase models depended on the type of software you were buying. If you're buying a desktop copy of Lotus 123, that's typically a per unit or per copy licensing model. But if you're buying a networkable or shareable, time shareable piece of software, those were often licensed on the number of users that were going to access it or how many connections that were going to be active using the software at once. The benefit with commercially developed software is that a software producer like Microsoft or Apple um, performs extensive quality control and testing on the software to ensure that it can be used in a, a wide variety of devices and situations and by different classes of users. So, for example, in higher-end commercial software, the accessibility or use by 
people who have specific physical conditions or disabilities is pretty much assured. You're also assured with commercial software that it's going to be compatible with a wide, ver wide variety of devices. And software producers, commercial software producers, provide regular updates, bug fixes, and feature additions or enhancements. And they all offer support services, as well as training and documentation. There's also risk management. Users are indemnified if, for example, the uh, software producer um, is uh, not ethical and um, uses uh, copyrighted code or code that they don't have the rights to. Now, the drawbacks to using commercial software, as we all know, is that it's an ongoing expense. The cost to start using the software is typically what we would consider high, and then there's an ongoing expense uh, for upgrading to the next major version of that software, or if you need to buy additional licenses so that more than just yourself can use it. Now, also, commercial software producers, they do offer support services, but if you stay with the current version of your whatever software package you're using, like Microsoft Office, uh, over a number of years, the amount of support you're going to be able to get for that software uh, diminishes. And at some point, uh, the, the vendor will no longer offer any sort of support for that uh, software. And if you need customization, and this is really dealing more with business class software that um, is used by an organization rather than an individual. But customization, additions, modifications definitely cost, and you need to have a commercially certified uh, software developer that knows how to work with the software that you're trying to customize specifically, and they tend to be expensive. Now, in the early 1980s, um, the idea of what we today called open source software developed. And it was quite informal. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't initially a, an organizational mentality around the idea that software should be more easily accessible at a lower cost. Um, but the idea caught on, uh, especially with smaller developers or small companies that were trying to get their software into the market and compete with larger commercial uh, software developers. One of the indirect premises of the open source movement is that rather than spending IT on software licensing, that is buying copies of software from a, a huge vendor, that IT expenses within an organization are better spent on paying developers uh, as employees or contractors of the company to produce software rather than trying to sell it, you know, sell software as a commodity. Now, early iterations of the open source movement were born out of what we would call shareware and freeware movements. Uh, freeware, as it states, uh, is the offering of an application absolutely free of charge. Sometimes developers do ask for donations, but they won't put a restriction on your needing to, to uh, make a donation in order to use the software. And there's still a lot of freeware around. They typically tend to be smaller class of applications, so things that are utilities, uh, small uh, feature-specific applications. 
And then there is also shareware. Shareware involves uh, offering a free trial, but then requesting the uh, user um, if they should want to keep the software over a longer period of time than the trial, pay a license fee. And oftentimes you'll see shareware um, applications that are, are very sophisticated and, and uh, have many features and um, are um, extremely useful to have around. But if you need to use them, say, for more than 30 or 90 days, then you're going to have to pay a license fee to continue using them. And then you, you essentially purchase the software outright. Now, at first, these open, what we would consider the progenitors of the open source movement, just offered compiled applications for the most part. Uh, so the actual software product in a runnable form was offered. Later, the movement expanded greatly to provide access to source code so that a developer at a, a local company could get the source code, modify it to meet that, the local company's specific needs uh, himself, him or herself rather than relying on the uh, software developer, uh, the original software developer, to make the changes for them. Now, over the history of open source, shareware, freeware uh, movements, there's been a lot of criticism from the commercial software development community. Uh, you all may remember that uh, in the in 1980s, uh, Bill Gates uh, authored an open letter uh, that vehemently criticized uh, the notion of, of open source or freeware software. And it also um, was a huge defender of the licensing, commercial licensing model. Uh, so that um, he decried anyone who bought one copy of a piece of software and shared it uh, among multiple individuals. And that has, has resulted over the years in a great deal of antagonism between commercial software vendors and uh, open source or freeware slash shareware vendors. Open source software is today available in a variety of different formats and from a whole wide variety of different locations. So for larger open source applications like Drupal, the one we're going to work with, um, there's typically a community website where that software is offered, um, also includes support uh, knowledge base of information about the software uh, offers uh, plugins and additional features for the software. And as we're going to see in your, your reading uh, for uh, this learning module, you know, there's a variety of different offerings that are uh, open source in every category of software. So in the content management system, uh, software niche, um, there are multiple offerings. In fact, there's probably 20 or 30 that, that I'm aware of. Uh, the most popular, however, include Drupal, uh, Joomla, WordPress, maybe a couple of others. Uh, SharePoint has uh, some freeware components as well. Um, so there's a wide variety of offerings in almost every software category. Uh, there's also a wide variety of ways to get to the software. Now there are also different types of open source software repositories. So the sort of umbrella uh, platform that is currently popular is called GitHub. And GitHub is both a repository, a huge repository in itself, where 
you can go sign up and have a place to uh, uh, post your publicly available software. GitHub can also be run locally, so as a, a repository for an individual organization or for a particular subject uh, specific type of software. And then there are also there are other other more generic platforms for publishing software. They can your open source software developer can have a very simple website where they develop and uh, offer their uh, software products. Now, it's a slight misnomer to say that open source software is free or equivalent to what we would call freeware. A variety of licensing uh, restrictions can uh, be applied to open source software, and it really depends on the class of the software and the type of software application and the size of the organization that is offering the software. So for example, um, I am looking at right now uh, an open source application called Archive Space, which is very popular for library special collections right now. Now it is an open source application However, the uh, producer of the software requires that after a, an initial trial period that uh, you uh, purchase a support plan and a licensing scheme for that software. So they allow you to download it, but they're also trying to track uh, people who use their software and make sure that they pay at some level for the use of the software product. Now that said, once you pay your fee for the software product, uh, you are able to get the source code and make modifications to the product uh, to meet your local needs. So it's still potentially a cheaper, um, way of um, acquiring software and making it work in your local environment than, say, purchasing outright um, a high-end commercial application and then having to have a certified uh, commercial developer uh, provide your uh, local modifications. Other open source software, like Drupal, for example, um, there is no fee whatsoever for use of the software uh, in any context. Now, you can optionally buy from private companies um, a support package that will cost money that will, but will provide you with uh, technical support for a package like Drupal. But that's, again, completely uh, optional. Um, so there's a wide range of offering um, types uh, within the open source software category. Now, development of open source software and support of open source software is often provided on a community basis. So again, if we use Drupal as an example, um, the Drupal initiative uh, relies on volunteer community developers um, for not only the development of the core Drupal software uh, uh, server application, but also for any of the plugins or add-ons uh, that are available for Drupal. Open source software is has uh, also spurred a variety of other licensing models that we're not going to go into any depth today, but uh, the new or a GPL license or copyleft are both examples of those types of licensing. Now, what are the benefits of using an open source software package? Well, it's free to own within a a specific window. So I explained in the last slide that um, 
you may you know may be able to get the software completely free or you may only be able to use it for personal use before you have to start paying for it or you um, may just have a trial period in which you are able to use the software. Now it is for the most part um, open source software are free to customize yourself. Some open source providers um, do put a a requirement on any customized versions of their software and state in their license to you that if you're going to modify my software then you've got to share it back out to the entire community you can't keep the customizations just to yourself and most open source software does provide some level of documentation or community technical support. So you, usually you can get some, some base level of help in how to install and configure and use the software. And it depends widely on how popular the open source software is, how many volunteer community supporters are uh, working for the, the software project and so forth. Now the drawbacks to using open source software are many and, and as an information manager at any sort of organization you should, should mull over these drawbacks uh, very carefully before trying to implement an open source software package. So because the software is is created on, and maintained on a mostly volunteer basis. Uh, there's often inconsistency, quality testing, and um, uh, limited, sometimes limited device compatibility. Um, often uh, the open source software is uh, available only on one specific platform. So for example, you may need a Linux server to run a server application and there may not be, for example, a Windows-based server uh, application. You know, uh, software may run on Windows but not on Apple iOS. Um, so there's a, a variety of um, inconsistencies and limitations depending on the individual software uh, project that you're trying to use. Also, um, what we call maintenance of the software, um, updating it, fixing bugs, um, improving features, the speed at which uh, fixes and updates are made in open source software can vary greatly again with the package. So. Um, you may need, for example, if you become dependent on a open source software package at your business and you uncover a bug that you have to have fixed, you may have to pr pay a developer uh, locally to fix that for you because you may not be able to wait for six months to a year or even longer for that particular bug to be fixed by the original software developer. Uh, sometimes there's a wide variation on the quality of the documentation. Uh, sometimes the documentation is very limited and essentially you have to figure out how the software works by uh, using it. Uh, and sometimes um, the, soft, the documentation gets out of date and out of sync with the current version of the uh, software application. So I run into this uh, frequently with a number of open source applications that we use at the UNM libraries. Um, there's a journal publishing package, for example, where the documentation is probably um, a year or so behind uh, the actual current software release. 
Uh, as I mentioned, you may be responsible for your own bug fixes or if you want to improve the software and add features, uh, you may have to pay for that rather than uh, waiting for somebody else to do it. Um, also, again, support can be very slow uh, and very limited. And then the software life, lifespan is very uncertain with open source software because it's all maintained by a volunteer community of developers, at least for the most part. So there's a good risk that uh, if those volunteers lose interest and move on to some other software project that they want to uh, focus on, that your, um, the software that you are using may become obsolete. And uh, either you will have to uh, spend money on a developer to try to keep the software maintained, or you'll have to face moving your data from the software that you're using to another platform. So overall, there's, um, there's, there's a good deal of risk that an organization faces by using open source software. Now there's less risk in larger, very popular software applications than Drupal. It's, I picked Drupal as our example because it is one of those packages that has a very active user community and um, looks like it will be around for a good long while. But if you just pick a software application out of the hat of all the open source um, apps that are available, um, chances are you're going to come up with one that um, has a limited lifespan and is good to use this year, but probably you'll have to find another um, comparable application, commercial or open source, next year. So there's a very, a very high degree of risk uh, involved in using open source software. And as long as you're aware of that, um, it, you, know, you can take steps to mitigate the risk uh, for your organization. We've already covered this to a great degree, but customizing software or having software written for you from scratch is sometimes um, an organization is forced to go this route to actually hire a developer or contract with a development firm uh, to write a piece of so specialized software that uh, the organization needs to run its business properly. Um, this can be a good thing and a bad thing. On the good side, you know, when you have custom software made for you, you're getting, hopefully, exactly what you need for your organization. On the bad side, um, Custom software can take a great deal of time, effort, and um, money to produce. So you should only fall back to the custom software model uh, if you cannot find uh, another open source or commercial software application uh, that will fit your needs at least for the most, most of the functions that you need. So, and it also customized software is a long-term financial commitment um, that um, because you're gonna have to uh, have updates, um, security patches, a whole variety of bug fixes and other types of maintenance uh, tasks you know, performed to that software to keep it running long term. And that's why mainly large institutions write custom software applications. So a large organization like uh, UNM or one of the larger commercial 
uh, vendors, you know, companies in uh, the Albuquerque area or uh, government agencies like the Air Force nearby. Um, these larger institutions, you know, have money and resources to devote to uh, custom software development. But as a small organization manager, uh, you're going to have to be very careful about uh, trying to go down that path uh, because of the uh, resource requirements. Fortunately, in terms of customized software that needs to be written, there is much less of a need for it today than there was, say, 10 to 20 years ago. Uh, because so many applications have been written, uh, many of them are open source and can be edited, um, and you have a choice between a variety of, of different types of applications in the same function category. So, for example, um, you can buy Microsoft Office for your office um, information creation and management needs. You can also use OpenOffice or LibreOffice uh, to open source um, alternatives, or you can, um, you can mix and match and say buy a commercial database product like uh, FileMaker Pro, uh, and then you can use um, a, a open source word processing or spreadsheet application. Also, you know, um, in many cases, uh, applications that were, that were not available 10 to 20 years ago are now part of the operating system. So, uh, for example, in the Apple operating system, you get a whole variety of um, sort of multimedia authoring tools and um, presentation tools that come uh, with the purchase of the operating system. Um, Windows also has a variety of different tools. So Microsoft 10 uh, just came out with um, a 3D Paint application that lets you do um, 3D types of graphics. Um, so the chances that you will need a completely customized software application today are much less than 20 years ago. So let's talk about some categories of software applications and as an information manager it is helpful if you are aware of how uh, information systems work from the hardware level up that doesn't mean that you have to be a developer or a systems administrator yourself, however. So some of the category, major categories of software that everyone has to deal with in one form or another include firmware. Firmware is the actual co machine level code that um, delegates uh, data back and forth uh, between the higher software, higher level software applications and the hardware uh, that runs the software, software. So we've all had the experience of needing a firmware update for different types of peripherals or uh, computer hardware components. Drivers are sort of the next step up from firmware. Drivers enable specific uh, components, hardware components, to work together with a computer system. And the operating system is the next level up. The operating system manages all of the drivers and provides a user interface into the computer system. Uh, we're all familiar with the major operating system uh, platforms. There's Windows. There's the Apple platform. Uh, there's also several different Linux-based uh, platforms, including Ubuntu and uh, some other um, graphical user interfaces for 
for Linux. And then on top of the operating system, uh, run desktop or server applications. And depending on what type of hardware you are working with, depends on what kind of software you put on that hardware. So for a typical desktop computer system, you're going to add desktop applications like Microsoft Office, Adobe Acrobat, and a variety of tools like um, Photoshop and so forth that are intended to be sophisticated tools with good user interfaces that an individual computer user uh, manipulates. On a server class piece of hardware, um, one can run a web server and web applications, web applica based applications, or other types of server applications. So let's look at server software real quick. The server class software applications um, can either be part of the server operating system in the case of file servers. Typically, um, those uh, file server uses just the server operating system to provide users with access to files in hierarchical directory structures. Or a server can run a variety of different types of server application software pieces. So a uh, very common server class application is a database server. So if you've heard of um, Microsoft SQL Server, um, MySQL, um, and other uh, open source database applications, Typically, a database needs to work with another type of server-based application to provide an interface into it. So a database doesn't usually function just by itself. It is a part of a larger application. The same thing with media servers. Uh, we use media more and more every day, um, streaming audio, video, um, interactive, uh, multimedia applications, uh, graphics, etc. Um, media needs to be delivered in an economical way called streaming. So media servers usually, again, work with another server-based application uh, and sometimes with database servers as well uh, to provide uh, streaming audio and video services to a user. Now, the web server is a core component of most server applications today. Uh, the web server uh, provides access to uh, applications uh, and um, simple, even just simple web pages. Um, and usually the web server works in concert uh, with other types of applications to provide the user with uh, specific server functionality. Mail servers are another type uh, that allow us to send and receive email. And all of these things, and then before we go further, let's just mention authentication and security. These can run as components of a server operating system or a, a software uh, application like a, a web server component uh, has security uh, components built into it. So all of these typically work together to provide a complete uh, server application that an organization can use and uh, users are able to interact with. Now, one specific type that we're going to talk about today is a content management system, which is a specific type of application server that bundles support for all of these other previous servers together in order to provide um, an information 
search and retrieval system that is easy for uh, computer users to access over the web. And if we were going to look at the way a server is built, we might create a little diagram, a layered diagram like this. You can see down at the very bottom we have our hardware components. And then the hardware components are managed by the operating system and the drivers. So if we are going to look at um, Drupal, uh, our content management system of the week, uh, Drupal can run on a Windows operating system or a Linux operating system. More often you'll see it on Linux about probably 90% of the time. On top of the operating system, you need a database server and a web server. Um, the web server uh, can be uh, on Linux systems, usually Apache, what's called Apache, or it can be um, IIS or another variety. IIS is the Microsoft web server that comes bundled with um, Microsoft server operating system. And then a database server. So that could be a Microsoft SQL Server, or it could be a uh, MySQL or other um, brand of um, SQL-based uh, databases that are very typical with content management systems. Now sometimes uh, there's a class of software that simply um, manages uh, transactions between the application and the lower level components like databases, file servers, and web servers. And this is either called a middleware component or a transaction server. So for Drupal, um, the middleware is called Tomcat. And then of course there's the the, at the highest level, the end user and the system administrator um, both interact with the application through the application server uh, user interface. So that means that uh, if, if I am the system administrator for a Drupal website, I would install all of these components that you see on the chart and then I would log in through the application server in order to manage most of them. Some of them have to be managed still sort of under the hood and behind the scenes at the, at a, and use different um, user interfaces, for example, um, uh, in, uh, even with a Drupal system. Your typical system administrator is going to have to log in through the operating system uh, to manage the database, uh, middleware, and web server components, but a lot of those components can also be managed through the application server. And uh, before we finish up, I'll just give you a quick history of, of the Drupal content management system. It was originally written by uh, Dries Boitert, a Dutch computer scientist, and he <clears throat> says he was actually a, a student when he wrote the first version of Drupal uh, as a file sharing application for the students in his dorm, if I remember that story correctly. Um, and uh, the word Drupal kind of got mashed up along the way. Originally, the application was called Drop or, and was first manifested as drop.org. And the word Drupal with two Ps is the Dutch word for drop. Um, but that second P got, got um, omitted at some point in its history and um, the application became popularly known as Drupal with one P. And Drupal is actually closer in Dutch to the word village. Um, so it, that was kind of a popular moniker for the software. 
Now, Drupal is uh, interesting because it um, is managed very effectively by the Drupal organization, um, the open source organization. And Drupal comes as a core software application that you install. And that core application does have many useful features, but uh, the, the great value of uh, Drupal is that the Drupal user community has written thousands of different uh, modules that uh, can be plugged into Drupal to extend its functionality. So for example, the core Drupal software includes basic web pages, user management capabilities, uh, a search um, and retrieval system, but it doesn't allow you, for example, to, to add uh, maps or um, geospatial data to your web pages. So if you need uh, to be able to publish a map on your Drupal website, then you would go to the drupal.org um, home website and look up a module that, that serves maps and makes them available. And then you would take that module software from the Drupal site, download it, and install it into your Drupal core server at home. And then suddenly your Drupal website is able to uh, display and publish uh, map data. So there are literally thousands of different uh, modules uh, that extend the functionality of the Drupal system, and that's the big reason why it has become a popular platform. Currently, the, uh, the release is um, uh, release 8. However, it's not a very mature release. So going back to what we discussed earlier in the lecture about um, open source software is often um, uh, not not the not the best developed um, when it's released and and can have bugs and other problems uh, with it, including poor documentation. And that's kind of how Drupal works: is that they'll release their the the core system as a kind of very incomplete work in progress. And usually you wait for the Drupal community to, uh, to polish up the core release. So it's a long way of going around saying that while the current release is 8.0 uh, for Drupal right now, um, most, unless you're willing to, to uh, be experimental and uh, put up with um, problems or limitations in the software. Uh, right now, it's still prudent to install uh, Drupal 7 uh, to make sure that you have a, a stable, uh, well-documented, and well-supported uh, system. Probably will wait for another year or two uh, before uh, Drupal 8 will be um, polished up, refined, and uh, um, as problem-free as Drupal 7 is right now. So let's quickly um, finish up by talking about your um, the rest of your learning module assignment. So there is an online introduction, which I hope you've already read, and you have finished the online lecture, so you can put a check mark next to that one. I do have a couple of readings that are very easy for this module, and they will just introduce you to uh, Drupal as a platform and how it works. And then we have a site building assignment. So each of you is going to create your own Drupal content type, which is um, a, um, a record uh, data form, and um, build a couple components uh, that help you use and manage data in Drupal. And then there is some interesting further reading. Uh, if you have time, uh, I would recommend downloading and 
saving the further reading for after the semester if you're um, so you can get all your assignments completed but uh, the further reading is definitely worthwhile all right so there is also a uh, demo video for you to watch for the assignment as well as detailed instructions so go ahead and uh, do your assigned readings next and then move on to the assignment and as always I'm available by phone or email if you have any questions. So have a good week, and I hope you enjoy the uh, Drupal assignment.